Kurt Thomas. His title, three-time world gymnastics champion. His assignment, a secret mission for the United States government. His only weapon, himself. And that's all he needs. Combine the discipline, the timing, and the power of gymnastics with the explosive force of karate. And a new, all-powerful martial art is born. Jim Kata. Kurt Thomas becomes Jonathan Cabot. He must penetrate a mountain fortress to compete in an ancient savage ritual. They call it the game. But nobody wins. And nobody lives. Until now. When gymnastics and karate are fused, the combustion becomes an explosion. And a new kind of martial arts superhero is born. Jim Kata. All right. Welcome. That was a trailer for a movie that came out in the 80s called Jim Cotta. Uh, after the 84 Olympics, the U.S. men's gymnastic team, uh, they all got movie deals. And that was probably one of the worst of the films with uh, Mitch Gaylord's American Anthem as a close second. Um, but, you know, gymnastics were hot. Ninjas were hot. And the Cold War uh, was was really was really heating up. So today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about China. Uh, China has been in the news of late because a story broke from the BBC about some uh, about a genocide. They say that's going on with the uh, ethnic minority group, the Uyghurs. Um, also, uh, was it last spring uh, there were student protests. Uh, that uh, dominated the the news cycle. So I've had this gentleman on the show before. Uh, he is a professor at New Mexico State. I met him through the great Gloria Lariva. Professor Ken Hammond, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here. Always glad to come. And also, I, I, I usually do this first, and I apologize. My co-host, my homie, my dog, Pascal Robert. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Good to see you again, Jason and Professor Hammond. Looking forward to your insights on China as well. Well, we'll see how it goes, Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we when we think about China, uh, and I I'm trying not to say it like Donald Trump, so I, I apologize, but he just kind of burned in my head. Um, he definitely really doubled down on whatever the Obama administration was trying to do, especially with the tariffs. Um, and China gets a rap for being, you know, super authoritarian, um, free speech is, is non-existent because they don't have these American platforms that we have Facebook and I believe there's no Twitter there. Um, and the talk of the Uyghur genocide, I asked a question in the description of the show. Is it being, are they almost using the Me Too movement to kind of be, use it to weaponize it against against China? Uh, because we're hearing all these really horrible, horrible stories uh, of forced hysterectomies, um, rape. And, and we don't want to, belittle anybody's story but uh as pascal and i were saying before you came on um there is talk that some people feel that a lot of the protests in the west are i wouldn't say a psyop what did you call it pascal a color a color revolution but sponsored by the west yes what would you say professor hammond about the average take that you see on China and just the mainstream media? 
Sure. Well, I think the the, the mainstream media is is fa fairly uh, united in uh, putting out a, a pretty strong anti-China uh, position, an anti-China narrative. I mean, you mentioned the uh, all the all the things that are alleged to be going on in uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, former Secretary of State Pompeo, of course, characterized that as genocide and crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I think that uh, that the portrayal that we see and, and what we hear about China in the news, whether it's Xinjiang or Tibet or Hong Kong or, or a, a number of other narratives that, that you know, get, get put out on a pretty regular basis, they're all pretty uniformly negative and they're all pretty, pretty well designed to foster a sense amongst Americans that, you know, China is kind of a terrible place and, and we should be fearful of them. And, you know, they're, they're at best a, a challenge and, and really kind of, kind of our new enemy. And I, you know, I'm, I think that's a really uh, wrong and I feel that that's not a, uh, not, not a very, not a very accurate or realistic portrayal of, of the, you know, what's going on in China uh, today. Mm -hmm. um, somebody says, I feel that the mainstream media can be wrong on China and that China is also guilty of atrocities at the same time. They are not mutually exclusive. I guess my question is, what are, what are the atrocities um, that they would be guilty of? And I'm, I'm not saying they are not, I'm just asking the question, what are the, the, the atrocities? That, that well, you mentioned, you just mentioned, uh, you know, some of these reports there, there's kind of a, kind of an endless stream of these stories that come out. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and if we just think about Xinjiang, mm -hmm. well, Xinjiang is a region in Western China where uh, the, the population is, is primarily uh, people of, uh, of uh, Turkic speaking ethnicities, the Kazakhs, the Uyghurs, the Uzbeks, people like that. Mm -hmm. um, and there, these are Muslim societies. Uh, and uh, so the, the allegations, you know, basically are built around the idea that, that uh, the Chinese government is trying to destroy their traditional culture, trying to force people to mm -hmm. behave in ways that are antithetical to their beliefs. Mm -hmm. uh, that they're rounding people up and putting them in concentration camps and imposing these things like uh, uh, forced sterilization and all yeah. that. And, and, you know, the, unfortunately, uh, that those kinds of reports and those kinds of stories get a lot of credibility in, in, in the mainstream media. But uh, they tend to emanate just from two sources. Uh, one of them is uh, a, a fellow who uh, lives and works in Germany, a guy named Adrian Zenz. Yeah. And if you read the the original reports, if you read the stories, you know, one of the things that happens, of course, in the mainstream media is you get this echo chamber effect where one publication puts something out and then a dozen others refer to that report as if that re initial report was the gospel truth. Mm -hmm. but if you go back and you look at what the real sources of a lot of these stories are, they come from this figure, Adrian Zenz, who is... You know, he's a he's a fundamentalist Christian. He hasn't actually been to Xinjiang. He has, I was going to say he's the guy that hasn't been there, right? <laughs> that's right. He, he gets a lot of messages from the Lord, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not opposed to uh, messages from the Lord, but I think that uh, we have to take them with a, a certain critical perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he he generally is the one who who uh, uh, you know puts out these these uh, these tales. Uh, there have also been a lot of instances. Uh, there's a there's a, a an outfit in Australia called the Aust Australian yep. uh, Strategic uh, Defense Institute, mm -hmm. uh, and and they have also been a source for a number of these stories. But many of their uh, stories have been based upon things like satellite observations that turn out to be photos from Google Earth, which, when they're investigated, prove to be not detention camps or concentration camps, but schools, hospitals, residential compounds, things like that. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, what we, <clears throat> what we need to recognize is that a lot of this information is dependent upon the fact that, uh, that most Americans, most people in the West, have no direct knowledge or information, have no experience of China, haven't been to China, don't mm -hmm. speak or read Chinese, and are entirely dependent upon these uh, these media and political outlets. Uh, so even though they may, you know, they put a story out and it has this sensational headline, and then later mm -hmm. you follow up with it, you find out, well, maybe it wasn't really accurate, maybe it was based on questionable informants. But if you do that over and over and over again, 
people begin to say, well, gosh, there, there must be something to this. You know, it can't <laughs> all be fabrications. It can't all be made up. But actually, if, if you, if, as I say, if you just trace the sources back, and that takes time and, and a certain, you know, deliberate effort, it turns out that, that these two uh, sources are, are, are the principal uh, outlets mm -hmm. for this. There are also organizations, for example, the World Uyghur Congress, um, which are uh, overtly political uh, movements, political anti-Chinese political movements that are part of the separatist agenda of trying to create a, a to split Xinjiang off from China and create an Islamic Republic. Uh, now, you know, that's something that I think any, any state uh, is going to have a problem with having, having forces that are trying to, to break up its territorial integrity and its, and its political administration. So we can distinguish between the, the more overt agendas mm -hmm. of organizations like the World Uyghur Congress and, you know, these other sources like Adrian Zenz and, and ASPI. But, uh, you know, either way, we're not looking at information that is generally widely uh, verified. And indeed, just recently, there's, there's a book that's been put out by a French scholar who went and spent time uh, living in Xinjiang, visiting a lot of places, in which he, he systematically debunks one after another of these stories and, and just, you know, argues pretty, pretty based on his direct observations that, that this is just not an accurate characterization. Are there tensions in Xinjiang? Are there people in Xinjiang who are involved with these movements against the Chinese government who are in favor of splitting off an Islamic Republic from China? Sure. But how much do they represent the will of the people? How much do they reflect, you know, broader social attitudes? I think that's that's highly problematic. So in your mind, is it one of those things where it's like if I go interview the most uh revolutionary cat in downtown Oakland <laughs> and say that he is the, the mouthpiece of everybody here. You might think that we're trying to start a, a new black Republic here in Oakland. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> that, that would be, that would be an interesting analogy. Yeah. I mean, we know, for example, that, that the United States itself, it isn't that the United States is just the passive recipient of this kind of information. Mm -hmm. Organizations like the, uh, National Endowment for Democracy, uh, which is, you know, funded by Congress and is a, you know, a, a semi, uh, uh, semi clandestine organization. Some of their activities are public. Some of them are carried on behind the scenes, but that they have been involved in the so-called color revolutions all over the world. Uh, and, and they go in and they, they very uh, directly and, and explicitly uh, support <coughs> any kind of activity that is designed to undermine the credibility or the viability of governments uh, to which the United States government is, is opposed, you know, and, and the U.S. wants to put political pressure on China uh, because of China's economic development, because of China's increasing role in global affairs and East Asian affairs. They want to put at least put pressure on them uh, to, to try to thwart their emergence as a as a regional uh, kind of power and uh, you know to 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 dismiss the idea that there's an agenda behind these stories that there's somebody uh, you know who's who's kind of encouraging shall we say the, the mm -hmm. these movements um, I, I think that's 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 naive and I think that uh, we have to recognize that that power politics is involved here uh, on a very profound scale did you have a question, Pascal? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to really address to, to, to the brass tacks is that how much is the projection that we see in American media and American intelligence discourse towards China basically coming from the fact that the United States sees China as a potential counter hegemon to American and NATO world, offering options to third developing world and developing nations in terms of cooperation as we see in China and Africa and other parts of the world that the West may be left out of its traditional role as the arbiter of affairs on the globe when China may actually be able to more effectively play that role. How much is that uh, consideration? Oh, I, I, I think that, that you, you hit the nail right on the head. I think that that's exactly the, the underlying agenda here, that the United States for you know, several generations now, certainly since the end of World War II, 
has been the preeminent power uh, in, in certainly in, in the global capitalist system. And, and since the fall of the Soviet Union has really been the dominant power uh, on, on the earth. Uh, and and uh, has had it, uh, you know, we've kind of had it our way, if you're the American government, for a long, long time. So that is, uh, you know, their perception, the perception of the ruling elites in America is that if China comes on the scene, if China becomes more prosperous, more highly developed, more economically competitive, and if it if it presents itself in the region and and in larger in a larger global arena as a as a, a legitimate participant, that that's a that, that's a threat to continued American dominance, can continued what we call American hegemony, and I think that uh, the you know that 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 threat is deeply unsettling. They see it as a zero sum game that 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 if that China's rise must be a threat to America's continued power and prestige and preeminence. And I think that that's an unfortunate perception because I, I think that from the point of view of the American people, it would be better if if uh, you know the two countries could find ways to cooperate and collaborate. You know, China is. Obviously, China did a much better job than, than the United States has in managing COVID. Uh, they're making tremendous strides in trying to deal with, uh, with global warming and climate change. They're, they're pushing all kinds of, uh, of uh, 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 programs that are, that are designed to, to you know, produce a, a better quality of life for their people and, and to some extent to share that uh, with, uh, with a wider, uh, a global, you know, in the wider global arena. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that China is perfect. That doesn't mean that China is some kind of worker's paradise, that everything is, is just, uh, you know, uh, roses and, 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 and flowers and all that every day in China. China has serious problems. You know, they have, there's a lot of corruption in the system. They have, ser they got serious environmental challenges and problems. You know, there, there, there's a lot of things that are problematic. There's a lot of difficulties that, that China is facing. And, and it's not like everybody over there is just, you know, let's have one big group hug. But I think that, that you know, to, to demonize China and to think that China is sort of the new evil empire that has to be somehow, uh, you know, contained and blocked and thwarted in its efforts to uh, improve its, its economy and, and the livelihood of its people. I think that that's a, that's a misplaced apprehension uh, you know, certainly by, by American people. Uh, you know, it may be that China's rise does pose challenges of one type or another to American elites, to American business interests, to American military and political interests. But, you know, maybe it's time for the United States to find ways to share the planet with other powers. You know, the idea that the world should simply be the, the, the playground, the arena for the, for the extension of American policy interests. That that seems that seems unrealistic uh, in in the world in which we find ourselves today. I think a more multicentric uh, global order is what's emerging, and and I think that that's probably something that we should welcome. Interesting. Do you think that the concerns that the West has about China? particularly when I, uh, my interest in China on the African continent. There are many uh, in the United States, particularly member, many uh, members of the uh, African diaspora, some would call themselves Pan-Africanists, who are a little leery of China's emerging development and role on the African continent in terms of whether or not it's an actual bilateral, mutually beneficial kind of relationship. Or is China actually coming into the African continent as the new style colonial power to with a kind of uh, exploitative model of extraction that really threatens the sovereignty and the integrity of the nation states in, in Africa. Now there are others, I've heard many Africans say that China provides a more humane uh, option in terms of bilateral participation than the West traditionally does. I'd like you hear. I'd like to hear your thoughts more in terms of China's role in Africa, and if this, it's a mutually beneficial role, or is there are the threats of exploitation that some fear more reality than others would care to, to, to discuss? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think that uh, 
<laughs> if if I were uh, you know in 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 government or or in uh, in in some sort of uh, you know policy position or or, or public uh, discourse position in Africa, uh, you know I think that uh, there's been such a long history of outsiders coming into Africa in pursuit of their own agendas, uh, whether it was uh, you know European imperialism in the 19th century or American sort of neo-colonialism since World War II, I'd be a little wary. I'd be a little anxious about what was going on, uh, you know, when some new force, some new players show up on the scene. But I think that uh, if we if we look, uh, you know, objectively at uh, at uh, what China has been doing, and of course this isn't just in Africa. The things like the uh, 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 the, the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, extend to to other parts of Asia, even to parts of Europe. Uh, you know, and these are efforts like many of the uh, uh, undertakings in Africa that are that are that are designed to develop essentially global economic infrastructure communications transportation uh, uh, productive activities things like that and you know these are things which I think uh, China certainly talks about and and wants to present as a as a a matter of of kind of mutually beneficial development, the idea that that these are investments that are uh, uh, you know gonna gonna pay off in the long run, that are going to be useful for the people in these host countries, um, and 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 that it's a developmental initiative. And I think that, that that's not an, a completely unreasonable uh, position. On the other hand, uh, uh, you know, China isn't doing this. Uh, as a as a sort of uh, uh, a charity, China isn't doing this uh, just out out of the goodness of of its heart. These are these are initiatives which will certainly be in the long term interest of China itself. Now, does that mean? <coughs> excuse me. Does that mean that these are are exploitive uh, relationships? That does that does that construct these relationships as oppressive? Um, I don't think that's that necessarily that, that that's the only way to to read that. Uh, certainly, you know, when China goes into a country in Africa uh, and and helps to develop infrastructure, helps to build port facilities or roadways or railways or airports, uh, I think that those are things that are that are certainly going to be of value and, and use to the local economy. China is also investing in. Uh, in, in extractive industries and in agriculture, there's no question about that. Does the development of that uh, of that uh, kind of economic activity, um, you know, is that something that only benefits China? No. Is it something that only benefits the host country? No. These are things that are that you know China is doing as investments as part of its own ongoing project to develop its own economy. But China is. It's, it sees it, understands that that happens in the modern world in the context of a global economy. So, you know, it's a, it's a complex set of relationships. I think that that one thing to look at uh, and, and perhaps uh, give a little nuance to all that is that it, right now, in this context of the COVID pandemic, uh, China has been, uh, on the one hand, forgiving debt and on the other, uh, rescheduling debt repayment in some instances, because a lot of these countries have been hard hit by, uh, by the, the, uh, uh, the, the pandemic, and they're struggling, and they're having a hard time with, uh, with their, their domestic economies. And, you know, organizations like the World Bank and the IMF, you know, that go in and they dictate to these countries when their schedules of repayment are, and then there's all these penalties that go along with that. That's not how China has been handling this. They've been trying to be sensitive. They've been trying to to accommodate uh, the needs and the concerns of these countries in, in this immediate sort of crisis context. Now, of course, you can turn around and argue, well, of course, you know, they want to maintain these relationships so that they'll get paid back in the long run. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. They do want to get paid back in the long run. As I say, this is it's not a giveaway. It's not a charity program. It's a program of mutually beneficial development. Uh, does it proceed completely uh, frictionless? No, of course not. Uh, on the other hand, another way to look at it, and, and this, this reflects some of the complexity of these critiques, is that on the one hand, we're told that uh, you know China is going in and being the new uh, sort of uh, neo-colonialist uh, power. Uh, but 
It's also the case that China, uh, one of the fundamental tenets of Chinese uh, foreign policy since, since the 1950s has been non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. Uh, and so what that means is that when China extends loans or engages in investment activity, infrastructure development activity with countries in Africa and other places, that they don't impose political conditions. They don't go in and say the way that the IMF or the World Bank or the United States government does. They don't go in and say, you need to do this, you need to restructure your, your, your welfare society, your welfare payments, you need to reform, you know, you need to have a balanced budget and you can't have any deficit financing. They don't do that kind of stuff because they don't want to interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. So on the one hand, they get criticized for, uh, for going into these countries and, and investing in them and, and engaging in these developmental activities. But then they also get criticized for not imposing political conditions. And it seems to me that there's there's kind of a, you know, damned if you do and damned if you don't approach by the West uh, to, to these activities on China's part. Interesting, interesting. So, so what you're saying is that generally is that, you know, China – is acting in its natural interest as a as a, in a bilateral way with the African countries, but that in terms of the options, considering the past dealing with the IMF, the World Bank, and the U.S., you are optimistic that it provides a better option for the African nations. At the same time, it may not be exploitative to this in the same way, but it still is acting within the interest of China while providing benefit to these uh, nation states on the African continent that they may not have. Well, there have been criticisms by some about the way in which China penalizes the African countries for lack of loan repayment. For example, extracting resources, seizing assets, seizing banks, which are a few incidents that have happened as of late in terms of China's kind of uh, response to the inability of African countries to pay back on their debt servicing as, as, as supported by, by, by China. My position is not to take a yes or no either or position. My position is to, to not necessarily paint China as, you know, the uh, savior of all of the third and developing world, going back to the notions of the Bandung Conference, or to pose China as the new red menace. What I'm saying is that I think that we should acknowledge, and I think you have done so, that these are definitely more comp complicated, nuanced relationships between both actors. My question to you is that do you think that we should be, or those of us who have, who are in, interested in kind of global South continuum that challenges the traditional hegemony of Western nations like the US and like European, like, like the very colonial empires, that we should be vested in a cooperation between China, Africa, and the global South? Are we being naive in thinking that something like that is aspirational in the first place? Or should we traditionally uh, feel that such type of cooperation won't bode well for those countries that are not exactly in the best negotiating power? Well, I think that there's a couple of ways that, that countries in Africa and in other parts of, of uh, the world uh, can, can pursue their, their interests. Uh, one, of course, is through, through you know, as you've mentioned, Pan-African solidarity. Obviously, China is a huge country with, a, with the, you know, now perhaps the largest economy in the world. It's, it's got a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of momentum, a lot of force, you know, in, in their economic activities. Uh, and, and it's better if, if countries, not just in Africa, as I say, but, but elsewhere as well, uh, can uh, can show some solidarity, show some uh, some mutual support amongst themselves, but I think the bottom line has got to be, uh, you know, and 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 this isn't something that that gets resolved in 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 you know a weekend review of of something, but uh, you know the the question overall is going to be how beneficial are these programs, how well do things work uh, uh, for the for the countries that are hosting them, and I think that on the balance. Uh, most of the uh, most of the countries uh, uh, that are that are on the receiving end have you know have have derived significant benefits from this. As I say, you know, China's not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. It's not a charity program, and of <laughs> course, they're going to be seeking their own uh, their own best interests as well. But they have you know they're certainly 
publicly committed to working with uh, these local uh, uh, local governments and and local uh, uh, business uh, uh, concerns and things like that. And I think that uh, you know we need to we you know any of these projects, any of these uh, uh, initiatives going on with China, you know we need to we need to be critical, we need to be observant, and we need to see how that plays out in the long run. But I don't think that we're seeing a situation in which African countries are finding themselves, uh, you know, uh, newly impoverished or newly exploited in anywhere near the ways that uh, that you know Europe or Americans have. Uh, uh, for for you know a century and a half and more, I think that that China is trying to build a, a system of, of mutually beneficial development, uh, and and to the extent to which that can be encouraged and that can be monitored, I think that that's a that's a positive initiative overall. Now, someone in the chat's been uh, been sharing some articles, right? Because that's what it always boils down to with these discussions. It's like, well, I'll share an article and that's there's the proof and and i guess one of them was that uh, and we can't see unfortunately with the platform we're using we can't see what it, it is you're sharing when you do that um but i guess one of them is about uh, the, the china not having the bbc anymore and uh, another one was was a confession from a uyghur man about his time in a uyghur concentration camp um, I also like to add the fact that, and, and again, this isn't the, to say that, or what, what, what do you call it? Uh, this isn't what aboutism, but <laughs> I do love the fact that everybody loves to pile on China, but I never hear anyone talk about Myanmar, Burma, mm. and the Rohingya, mm -hmm. where you actually saw a migration of people, a ethnic minority move to neighboring um, Bangladesh. Bangladesh and you see the issues that they're having there even with the president who wasn't she a Nobel a Nobel laureate mm -hmm. for her work there trying to work with the military now she's got thrown out <laughs> and and you see what's going on with the Rohingya I believe it's the numbers in the hundreds of thousands that are that have been killed over there. And it, and it doesn't seem to get the same attention. And as I was talking with, I was telling Pascal, I was talking with a, with another friend, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Asatar Bear, we were talking about this. And the first thing he said is, whenever there's a genocide, there's always a migration of people. Um, and he goes, where is it at? Yeah. Um, when it when it comes to the, to the Uyghurs. So I, I don't know if you wanted to add on to that. Well, I think, you know, I mean, you mentioned of, of the situation in Myanmar, and of course, they're having a lot of turmoil there right now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, the about 600,000 uh, uh, Rohingya, you know, fled across the border into Bang Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Rohingya are, are a Muslim community. Uh, the part of Myanmar where they live uh, used to be a, a separate uh, uh, Muslim society. Uh, uh, called Arakan. Uh, now that was incorporated into the old Burmese state uh, a long time ago in the in the late 18th century. But uh, but those tensions, those those antagonisms, uh, uh, you know, persist in that area. Uh, Myanmar is is plagued by by a, a profusion of uh, tensions between the dominant ethnic group, the Bamars, the, the Burmese, mm -hmm. and and you know. Uh, Dozens, literally, of, of smaller ethnic communities, mostly located around around the fringes of the borders, with Bangladesh, with India, with China, uh, Laos, Thailand, all the all the way around the borders of, of Myanmar. Uh, you know, and I think that, uh, as you say, uh, you know, the situation there is is uh, has has been pretty stark and and very dire for the mm -hmm. Rohingya people. Uh, and and it gets some coverage. It gets you know when there's a when there's a military coup like there's going on right now, then mm -hmm. you'll get you'll get you know some headlines and and some sort of pro forma condemnations by Western political leaders. But it's not <laughs> at all like this kind of relentless campaign uh, 
Yeah. Of trying to to talk about about uh, uh, about Xinjiang, and as you say, I mean, there's there's there hasn't been some sort of mass exodus over the border into Kazakhstan. You know, I mean, Xinjiang has huge borders with with several Central Asian countries. We haven't seen any kind of of uh, flood of refugees. And and I was actually I was reading a news report just a couple of days ago, an interview with uh, with a, a a Uyghur gentleman from from Xinjiang. Um, Talking about you know his experience and and uh, talking about uh, how stupid it would be on the part of the Chinese government. You know the, the 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 central government is trying to develop Xinjiang. It has tremendous energy resources. Some people call it like the Texas of China. Uh, I've been out there. I've I've traveled out there and spent time in in in. And, and isn't it of isn't Xinjiang? Uh, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, it's okay. Isn't Xinjiang? in the middle of where this belt and road is going isn't that one of the places it's going through well it xinjiang is is right along uh, what was used to be called the silk road the old trade routes from china to central asia and on to india and persia and the mediterranean and all that mm -hmm. yes one of the components of the belt and road initiative uh, is uh, has been the construction of railways. It's now possible to put uh, you know freight containers on trains in in Shanghai or in, in in Guangzhou in southern China, and have them go all the way to to ports on the Baltic or the North Sea or the Atlantic, you know, in in one continuous uh, journey. And that's that has revolutionized transportation times. It's it's just cut down. Uh, it's it's facilitated a lot of transcontinental trade uh, the other side of course is in the in the maritime world and, and that's a whole different uh, realm yeah. but there's also been the construction of major energy pipelines uh, uh, oil and natural gas coming from Kazakhstan for example or Turkmenistan uh, mm -hmm. both coming into China but also some of that goes on to the west so yeah there's been a lot of, uh, of development going on out there can you talk more about the Belt and Road initiatives it's long terms uh, goals and particularly how it is perceived to present a threat to the, again that American hegemony hegemony in the area as well. Well, sure. I mean, if you if you if you think about it, uh, you know, it, it, and that's that's a fairly straightforward uh, 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 concept that that the Belt and Road Initiative is designed. Uh, and, and the Chinese are totally upfront about this. This isn't like some some sneaky, underhanded, you know, program. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is designed to develop uh, international uh, uh, economic development infrastructure. So, as I say, you know, railways on uh, you know across uh, Central Asia, uh, port facilities, uh, other kinds of transport facilities, railways, roadways in Africa, airports, things like that, uh, to you know, to to facilitate the transportation of goods and the and the communication of services uh, uh, around uh, Asia, Africa, uh, even even some parts of Europe, um, and and you know, to the degree to which that is a successful ende endeavor, you know, to the extent to which those those new uh, connections, those new uh, uh, you know uh, intersections are are successful and and built up and work. Um, that's going to facilitate uh, a, 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 a course, an itinerary of development, which will be beneficial to China. It will be beneficial to the host countries. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to contain a lot of that activity within the African and Eurasian communities. Uh, and so, you know, American interests uh, can, can if, they, if they choose to do so, can see that as, uh, as antagonistic. They can see that as... You know, oh, well, uh, you know, these guys are developing all this trade, all this interconnection, all this infrastructure over there. What about us? You know, isn't that just excluding us? Right. Uh, and, and of course, the premise for that is that American capital should be able to go wherever it wants, do whatever it wants without any restrictions, without any constraints and without any competition. Right. Uh, and so I think that that's really uh, at, at, at the bottom line is that the Belt and Road Initiative is seen as creating economic opportunities that are not uh, primarily focused on, on benefiting American capital. Uh, and so, you know, that, that becomes a, a, a bad thing. That becomes a, an antagonism. That becomes a, a threat, if you will, to the, uh, to the ongoing profitability of American, you know, capitalism. 
how would you say the uh, myth of the yellow peril, which is the way the West used to look at the uh, the Asia the Asia threat or the the the, uh, the threat of China figured in to how exactly the consciousness of China and Asia overall uh, works into the psyche of the American liberal elite? Well, I think that that's a that is a sad and and very unfortunate component of all this. Uh, because I think that uh, that 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 kind of racist antagonism uh, gets played to all too frequently. I think that, uh, for example, uh, under under the, the previous uh, administration, you know, uh, Trump and and his uh, his uh, cohort loved to uh, to talk about the China virus and the Wuhan virus and things like that. Uh, you know, really um, portraying. China as as a as a place of menace, as a place of threat. This idea that uh, that China's military development and you know China's China's military budget is just a tiny fraction of that of the United States, and yet the fact that they have any military at all is seen as you know as undermining America's uh, unrestricted capacity to project power wherever it wants. And I think that we see that that idea of the yellow peril. Uh, uh, unfortunately, manifesting itself right here uh, at home. You know, there has been uh, in the last year or so a uh, a, a real upswing in uh, uh, in racist attacks, violent attacks on uh, really people of any kind of Asian ancestry. Uh, uh, I think a lot of people in in the United States don't necessarily have a very sophisticated discrimination between who's Japanese or Korean or Chinese or or Bangladeshi or whatever. And so, uh, you know, there have been uh, uh, people of a a number of Asian ancestries who have been uh, physically attacked, subjected to verbal abuse, harassed, uh, in, in many places across the country, and I think that kind of that kind of racism, that kind of anti-Asian, anti-Chinese racism, is part and parcel of the the demonization of China, which is is carried on, you know, by by politicians and the media uh, pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, someone asks, obviously, in recent times, China has become more sustained by capitalism. Has the agenda of building towards communism been completely abandoned? That's from Sam. Yeah, well, that's a you know, <laughs> that's a very it's a very powerful question, and and I think that um, it, you know it has a it has a, a it has a, there's a long history that goes into to dealing with that particular question. There's no question about it though that China is uh, is engaged in the uh, uh, the global capitalist system. Uh, the, the global capitalist system is the system that exists on the planet. Unless you're going to sort of put walls around yourself and try to, you know, go your own way uh, uh, and, and rely entirely on your, your, your native local resources, uh, that engagement with the, uh, with the global economy is, uh, is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty compelling necessity. Um, I think that when we look at China today, what we see is not – uh, a, a capitalist society. We don't see a society in which capitalism, a capitalist class, a bourgeoisie, is uh, is in control of the government, uh, or is even in control of uh, of the economy. China has uh, uh, what we might call a hybrid economy, a, a mixed economy. Uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, the the Chinese made the decision that in order to develop their economy, to 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 develop the, the productive capacity of their economy, to raise the material standard of living of their people, that they would use market mechanisms. They would use markets to, to pursue that. To, you know, markets are, are you know, often very effective in the allocation of resources for development and things like that. Marx, uh, Karl Marx and, and Engels and the Communist Manifesto, the first part of that is a, is a whole text about how productive uh, the rise of the bourgeoisie was how European the European economy flourished that uh, that they would uh, you know that you know under under the the, the development of early capitalism. Uh, now you know what the difference is. The reason that I say that that it's not just a capitalist economy is that China is still uh, led by the Chinese Communist Party, 
And the Chinese Communist Party is, is, you know, their goal, their objective is on the one hand to develop the economy, to enrich the country, to, to aggregate social wealth, but to do that in a way in which, uh, you know, the party retains overall control and is able to, on the one hand, buffer the worst excesses of, of, of corruption and of abuse and, and now even able to begin to, to address some of the, the environmental damage that, that rapid development has produced. Um, there's no question that, that the use of markets brings with it all kinds of problems, uh, greater inequality. Uh, these environmental environmental challenges that uh, that the Chinese have have been facing very serious ones, uh, and and as I've said a few times, you know, corruption has has been a serious problem. But the party is there. The party is there to try to manage that, to try to smooth that out to to whatever extent is possible, and uh, and and they're what they say about what they're doing is that you know the 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 goal is to attain. Uh, first, you know, what they call today the initial stage of socialism, to mm-hmm. build on that, to rise to a higher stage with the goal of a communist future. But that's, you know, that's even Chairman Mao back in, in the 1950s and 60s said this was a goal that was going to take decades, if not centuries, uh, to attain. It's not something that's going to happen uh, overnight. And I think that, that that's a, you know, that's a, that's a pragmatic approach. Is that going to work? Is the Chinese Communist Party going to be successful in leading that process? Are they going to be able to retain the political high ground and 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 lead that process? I think that that's 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 still something of an open question. But I think that the approach that people on the left in the United States and elsewhere in the West need to take is not to sort of buy into the 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 Western imperialist narrative of demonizing China, but is to try to try to see China critically, to be supportive of those things in China which we see as contributing to its development and and to enhancing the livelihoods of the people, while being critical of the things that we see as uh, as you know problematic, uh, the inequality, the environmental problems, the corruption, things like that. I think that that we want to be. You know, one of the things you hear about China a lot is, uh, uh, and, and in the West, this, this gets portrayed as, as sort of anti-government sentiment, is that there's a lot of, of unrest. There's wildcat strikes. There's, there's demonstrations against, uh, uh, you know, real estate uh, projects and, and factory construction and pollution and things like that. I think that that's great. I think that, that the Chinese people uh, fight for their rights. They fight for their interests. And what we hear about are the, the, the instances where, you know, where injustice uh, prevails. What we don't hear about are the, the, the many, many, many other instances where people, people prevail, where, where factories get stopped, where pollution is cleaned up, where wages are, you know, rise, where safety conditions are improved. It's a struggle. It's an ongoing movement. And, uh, and and again, you know, it, it's as as we talked about with uh, with uh, you know the, the the Belt and Road stuff. It's not perfect. It's not a workers' paradise. It's not uh, you know it, it's it's a it's a rough and tumble, feeling your way you know crossing the river by feeling the rocks, as they say, kind of process. Um, and as I say, I don't I don't think there's a guarantee on how it's going to turn out. But I think that that as 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 leftists, as, as revolutionary, socialist, communist. We should be as encouraging and as supportive as possible while always maintaining a critical perspective. Um, there's some there's some questions here in the in the chat. Um, Carrie Robinson says, I think that if China wanted to pursue communism, they would need to advocate for a global worker initiative, which is opposite of their choice of a political power that they exercise in the world. Would you guys agree with that statement? Well, again, you know, Chinese foreign policy since the 50s, when certainly nobody thought that they were anything but revolutionary, uh, has always been based on non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. Just as China doesn't want the United States interfering in its internal affairs, China's, you know, pretty careful about not trying to do that uh, in, in, in other countries. I think that, again, you know, it's not a, it's not a approach. It's not a, it's not a, a frictionless uh, process. But I think, if anything, China's, China's hope, perhaps, aspiration, um, is that 
if they can be successful at developing their economy, at raising the quality of life of their people. And remember that just, just this past year, China finally achieved a state, a, a situation where they've lifted all of the people in China above the United Nations internationally recognized line of, of absolute poverty. You know, they've lifted 800 plus million people up to a better life. Jesus. Now, you know, that's that seems to me like a pretty significant accomplishment. We're, um, we're fighting over uh, checks for 1400 bucks. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> it, it's a it's a it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult. Comparison. But, yeah, I just I just feel that, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess that 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 what they're accomplishing, what they're trying to accomplish uh, uh, is 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 pretty legit, and 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 we need to try to be as as supportive of that as possible. Even though uh, it, as I say, you know, and I don't I don't want to I don't want to paint them as as you know the glorious vanguard of uh, of everything, mm -hmm. but I think that uh, uh, to to suggest that China has simply uh, that the Chinese Communist Party has simply abandoned. Uh, uh, the, the the path to socialism, the quest for socialism. Uh, I, I think that's a fundamental misreading of the realities of what's happening in the country. Uh, Do you think the way in which they are deemed China has been deemed as state capitalism is a fair assessment of their economy, or do you think that's a rather myopic way to explain how their economy functions? Well, you know, of course, uh, you know, in in, in China, uh, uh, for a long, long time, in, in the old society and old Confucianism, they used to they used to talk about what they called the rectification of names, the idea that that you have to call things by by what they are. You have to use the right term for for what you're talking about. And I think that uh, uh, you know the uh, to call it state, do we call it state capitalism? What you know, what's the right term? Um, I, the term that I use, when, what the Chinese call it, is uh, you know socialism with Chinese characteristics. I think, I think that referring to it, uh, uh, I often talk about it as as a as a, a type of market socialism. You know, the the state-owned enterprises are still the core of the productive economy. Uh, the the banking and finance sector is uh, is still. Uh, you know, uh, uh, state uh, state owned and managed. It's it's those are public assets and resources. Uh, yes, there's a private economy. Yes, there are capitalists uh, in China, and I think that. Uh, 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 you know, that's that's where a lot of the dynamism in the economy has come for. You have capitalists in China, but you don't have a capitalist class that dominates the state because the state and the Communist Party work together on this agenda of, of moving towards what they call a moderately prosperous society, trying to, as I say, smooth out the worst uh, aspects of, of, of uh, uh, impacts of the market. Um, you know, but it's a it's a it's a work in progress it's an experiment that's still under and as i say i you know i i can't personally predict or guarantee what the outcome is going to be we have another question what can you tell us about strikes and grassroots labor organizing among chinese workers well there's lots of strikes i can tell you that uh, <laughs> uh you know uh there are there are, you know there's <laughs> Workers in factories in China, workers on construction sites in China, uh, you know, they're they're in they're in an interesting kind of liminal position. Uh, these are people, for the most part, who have left their villages, left the homes uh, where they where they had grown up, uh, to go to the cities to work in factories, to work on construction sites, to take part in uh, you know in in in, in labor. Because that's a better living. They're going to make more money. They're going to have more access to 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 resources than what they're going to find, uh, you know, if 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 they stay home in the countryside. On the other hand, there is no question that that the that you know that labor uh, that that surplus value is is extracted from labor in China. That and that's a conscious policy of of the government and indeed. That was done, uh, you know, in, in the first 30 years of the People's Republic during the Maoist period, uh, because that's how capital is accumulated for development, for investment, for, you know, for, for other purposes as well, for social services as well. 
So yes, workers in Chinese factories, workers on on construction sites, workers in in the in the uh, in the agricultural sector as well. They 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 work. They produce value. Some of that value is going to you know is going away from them. Now, some of that, if they're working in the private sector, is going into the hands of capitalists. That's absolutely true. But that is part of this process of development. Uh, you know, attaining socialism isn't a matter of flipping a light switch. It's not something that happens because it's a great idea. Uh, you know, so let's all get together and, and now we'll be socialists. It's something that has to be built from the ground up uh, in, a, in a long and, and sometimes perhaps painful process uh, of development. Another question here. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, Pascal is just sleeping on the job. That's the problem. <laughs> you don't know to the I'm, I'm messing with you, man. I uh, have to commend you guys once again. Brilliant guests, brilliant joint hosts. It's not easy to find such great dialectic on this platform where you keep knocking it out of the park. Hey, <laughs> thank you, Sam. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So, side note, uh, for those of you guys new to the show, you've just been watching this on a live stream. For the better part of last year, I did this show audio only. And after interviewing uh, legendary Gloria Lariva, I, I think I asked a question in our conversation. I was like, do you know anyone that knows anything about China? And uh, <laughs> she referred me to, uh, to Professor Hammond. And there's a show I have. It's a, it's a much older show. I want to say it's like episode 30. You know, we're at episode one. Oh, <laughs> uh but uh it's it's a it's it's very similar to what you're seeing now it's me asking professor hammond a lot of myth interesting questions more so about uh the history of china so that got us talking about doing an animated series right uh which we the professor and i are gonna have another conversation about this tomorrow without you people <laughs> but uh we got the first pass on the animation yeah. uh, sir uh I'll, I'll let you explain what you did because i i think it's hilarious what you said <coughs> about me coming to you about the chinese history in two minutes <laughs> <laughs> well it, it was a, it's a challenge you know the idea being that uh, that we want to produce this series of uh of uh, you know little two minute uh, youtube type videos uh, uh, animations to to try and try and explicate some of the complexities of Chinese history, you know, and and it's uh, uh, let's just say it's an audacious undertaking. But we did uh, just get the first uh, sort of first run through the first draft of that, and it uh, it looks great. And I hope that we're uh, we're going to be able to develop this into a more full blown uh, exposition. So yeah, we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. And the first, the first run through is uh, the professor had this chart of China through the centuries, right? And I narrate a, a a monologue script that he did, and I made some music to it, and uh, a wonderful animator uh, animated uh, Jamie Luftless, I think is her name. She has the Lolita podcast. So if you guys are familiar with the very well known Lolita podcast and the show Robot Chicken. Uh, that's who's actually <laughs> animating this idea that I had. So it's not just Professor Hammond. Gloria Lariva is also going to do a history of uh, the Cuban Revolution and the Bolivarian Revolution. Uh, I, I spoke with uh, Rob Larson is going to do a history of um, Monopoly in the tech world. Great. So we're revolution too. Pascal already... <laughs> So basically, anytime I have a conversation with someone on the show that you guys find interesting, when it's all said and done, I go back and ask these people if they'd be down to be part of this project. So that's part of the project. That's also why we always ask, hey, you guys can be a patron. You really help out because these animators don't come free. So don't forget to subscribe to the page. Check like. Hit the bell button as well so you get the notification when our videos come up on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. All right. Uh, anything you're you're uh, you're hawking, Professor Hammond, other than knowledge? 
no, no, no. I'm just glad to be here. I, I you know, let me know when you when you want to take another round of this. It's always fun. I I'm excited. So I fell down this rabbit hole today, and Pascal will tell you. I don't know if anybody here uh, has is an Adam Curtis fan in the chat. Let me know. Yes, young man. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw that, but my son just ran in here to mean mug me. But um, <laughs> so we we do a show now. This show will be on Zero Books uh, next week, and I'm in conversation with Doug Lane, and he says, "Oh, Adam Curtis has a new documentary." Sends me the trailer to it, and it has. Uh, I'm probably gonna say her name wrong. Zhao Zhao Zhang, Mao oh, second one. Yeah. Zhao Zhang. Some guy named Michael X that I had never heard of in my life. You're an OG, Professor Hammond. You're an OG leftist. You ever heard of some black dude named Michael X from the UK? I can't say that I have. <laughs> I haven't met anybody that knows this cat. And and Afini Shakur, Tupac's mom. Ah. And basically so far i'm only one and a half episodes in it's it's uh they're talking about revolution i'm gonna play the trailer before we go so you guys can see it get all pumped up to watch it i had to get a vpn just to just to watch it <laughs> it's only in the bbc but um pascal are you are you I ready think to that, uh, i'm interested in watching that documentary but i think that uh Professor Hammond really, in a very succinct, succinct fashion, was able to address some of the major concerns that uh, some in the West have with China and to really penetrate the more noxious veneer of propaganda that we get through the West as well about this country that has demonstrated some of its greatest ability in uh, poverty reduction in modern history, and that is not getting its fair share only because the United States in basically it's kind of empire like greed tries to paint China as a threat to American and Western hegemony. And I think that I definitely agree with you that that's problematic, but I, in the same way in which you are, you advise leftists to uh, provide support to China and look to them for some type of support. I think we should also not be afraid to be critical when we see, you know, the Chinese Communist Party acting in a way that is unjust and working to the detriment of its citizens or the working class in this country, in the country as well. So, you know, I, I, I take you to heart in that regard. All right. And as Pascal was saying those very wonderful parting words, my son looked right at me and farted. Very nice. <laughs> Just stared me down right in the face and just, I was like, shh, loud farting ass kid. So, oh, also, so because of this and getting the VPN, getting all excited about this new Adam Curtis series, uh, every Tuesday morning at uh, uh, nine o'clock Pacific Standard Time, I do a live stream with the Left Flank Vets. And we talked about streaming this series uh every tuesday and there's six of them so for six weeks we'll stream this series and and break it down and i'm sure the left flank <laughs> break down, and i'm gonna give everybody the login to my vpn that needs it so they can watch it and they can break it down um because it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting take definitely when it comes to revolution and uh i i there was a part of me that was going to send it to you, Professor Hammond, beforehand to, to let you look at it, to see what your take was on it. Because uh, Adam Curtis puts uh, Zhao Zheng in kind of a, a really big power position. Did she have a, a hell of a power position towards the end of Mao's life? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he paints her as, as a bit of a vindictive uh, ladder climber. So well, sure. she has a very complex uh, uh, legacy. Uh, we'll, we'll go into that another time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to let you guys check out this uh, trailer. Thank you, Professor Hammond. And after this trailer is over, we are out. All this right. I'm going to get going. It's great to see you guys. And as I say, give me a holler and we'll do this again. Hey, thank, thank you so you much. Man. I'll talk to you tomorrow. 
All right. Yes, you bet. We'll see you. <laughs> Peace. Good night, comrades. Good night. I, I really wanted you. Uh, I, I, I want to show the animation for you guys, but I haven't heard back if it's cool from Jamie yet to show the first pass. So I will wait. We'll wait after this Friday meeting and then hopefully Saturday I can show you guys a little stream of this. But check out this uh, this trailer. for. Can you see him? I see him. Okay. Phoenix. What are you doing? Daddy's hosting the show. You don't care? He's hiding. So, Pascal, you have to say, where's Phoenix? Where's Phoenix? He's hiding some more. Okay. So, here's a trailer for the new Adam Curtis uh, documentary, Can't Get You Out of My Head. Also, a person that plays a big role in this is Afeni Shakur and Tupac. It's really interesting. Uh, he really gets into her Afeni Shakur story in the second episode. So let's watch this. Enjoy. Get ready. If anybody can't watch it or can't find anywhere to stream it, let me know. I found some U.S. sites that are streaming it. And if not, we can share this VPN, right? Because we're all homies in this. So real talk, you never seen that motherfucker before in your life too, right? That Michael X cat. No. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna shut up. Dude, does that look cool? Definitely looks like the guy who did the Century of the Self. Yes, yes, I told you it's very arty. Um, are you interested in that though? You can see the first two episodes on YouTube. Oh, the first two episodes on YouTube? Mm -hmm. I'll test the waters on those. It's I'm in it right now. I told you I got notes. I've been writing from it. This Michael X character is just fascinating to me. You're obsessed with Michael X. How can you just not know about some random dude like that? He was like, he said in a in a big time interview, he's like, I'm the most powerful black man in all of Europe. I'm like, I've never heard of you. You're like Kaiser Soze. <laughs> I'm gonna stop saying that. Ultimately, uh, now nah, I won't spoil anything. So Tuesday, nine a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Me and Marcus from the Left Flank Lights are going to be watching episode one, 
and uh definitely the left flank has a ton of comments that come through we'll definitely be talking to you guys on the on the chat thank you guys very much tomorrow or not tomorrow i'm sorry saturday at 9 a.m pacific standard time uh we'll be doing a live stream it looks like we'll be doing it uh conan neutron possibly is coming back saturday rob marcus uh marcus should be there saturday there's it, saturday might be a a little more jam packed because there's like four or five things I'm trying to do on Saturday that I haven't told Pascal yet that I'm about to tell him as soon 